So we have, I think we have this morning a panel that embodies SCTE uh, perfectly because we have the wide ranging area of IoT to discuss and we have two great presenters who are going to discuss IoT in its widest form. Um, Clark Stevens, uh, Principal Architect of Emerging Technologies will, of Shaw will demonstrate IoT on, at its software finest by doing a live demo of um, an IoT stack based on the OCF Foundation source code. So, so Clark is a brave man this morning. He has a running live demo. It's the first time I've ever stood up at a podium at an SCT show and seen real live code running on my left side here. So he'll be giving you an idea of how to build code in the IoT space. And then at the other extreme level of it, we have Charles Chuck Adams of Alpha, who is going to show you how the infrastructure that you have can be used to build up an outdoor IoT network based on long range technology like LoRa and how he's been looking for the last number of years on uh, how to make LoRa as efficient in the network for even low power battery sensor technology and optimizing the network and configuration there and some of the amazing applications that can be done on a unlicensed 900 megahertz um, solution. And so with that, I'm gonna hand you over to, to Clark to start us off and Clark's been around a bit. He's also been chair of UPMP. He's actually been on, he's a major contributor to the OCF IoT um, software initiative as well. So with that, I'll hand you over to Clark. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out at eight o'clock on the last day of the conference. <laughs> it shows some real dedication. And I'd like to especially uh, thank um, the technical crew who set things up here, they've been very accommodating. Um, I'm planning to show you a live demo with two different operating systems on two pieces of hardware running live on a Wi-Fi network in a conference. And so uh, the chances of working, I don't, I don't know, but uh, it did work before, so I'm gonna, gonna hope for the best here. So with that. Let's go ahead and get started. So we're gonna talk about building a cable-friendly Internet of Things and uh, what that entails. So as an operator, uh, we're not only out to serve our customers, but we're also out to um, make their experience great and to um, also protect ourselves. Uh, with uh, millions of people running on our networks, um, if one person uh, has problems, it can cause problems for the rest of the network. So it's uh, a real risk. So there's a few things that we need that serve both of those purposes. Uh, one, and the most important one, is security. So we've got to secure our own network against rogue devices, against viruses, We've got to secure the customer so that they can put things in their home that aren't going to put their home at risk. This becomes even more important as you talk about the Internet of Things because you're controlling via software real things in the house like the front door locks and that that put the customer potentially at risk if we don't do our job. Um, another thing that's important for an operator, since most of the Internet of Things are not things that we build, we have to partner with people. And uh, we want to create a good experience for our customer. So the customer's experience should be that they go to the store and they buy an IoT device and they bring it home and it's easy to add to their network. And by default, it comes on and it's secure and safe and works with other things in their network. Well, if, if you buy into a particular ecosystem like uh, Google's or, or Amazon's or Apple's, you don't get all of those things. So ideally, we'd like everything to work together. And the final thing is that we need to make this easy and efficient for people to build so that they can build the devices, the people that have the expertise can build the devices that do this interoperability, have the security, and um, makes it easy enough for them to build that they don't have to start from scratch. So let's talk about those things. With security, you've got to have several pieces of the puzzle. 
First of all, and most important is authentication. If a device claims to be something, you have to be able to prove that is something. And that uh, requires you to check back and have uh, things like roots of trust and uh, a secure infrastructure. The best way to do that is with uh, PKI infrastructure, and that's difficult and expensive to put together, uh, but it's, uh, I think in the end it's worth it, worth it. And that gets to the asymmetric and scalability aspect of it. So you need something that is not just uh, two people agreeing that they're who they think they are, but a whole ecosystem being able to scale and do that. Um, you also need authorization. So just because you can get on the network and you're, you're who you say you are, doesn't mean you have uh, the same privileges as everybody else. So you don't want uh, the parent in the home having the same privileges as the child or vice versa, or things get out of hand. And that may even go to the sub-level on a device. So maybe certain features of an IoT device, you want the children to be able to change, but other features you don't. You want exclusive control of those. So you've got to have very fine control of the authorization to do various things. You've also got to have a plan of what happens if the network is breached, if the device is compromised. So having all those things together is critically important to the protection of the customer and the protection of our networks. Um, you also need interoperability, as I mentioned before. Uh, there are several ways to do this. Um, one is that you go onto an ecosystem and that ecosystem supports every device you could ever want. Well, there isn't a, a solution like that. So what you need is interoperability. And especially as an operator, I think that's important because we want to provide a good experience for our users, regardless of which devices they, they purchase. And uh, most, um, most device manufacturers don't have that goal in mind. They would like everybody to buy their own devices. So um, wh what we need is something that can control things, a dashboard, for example, that works with devices from different ecosystems, from different manufacturers. Um, we need to have cloud support so you can co control things both within your home or business or outside of that. And that requires bridging. And we need to verify that all of these standards are met with a strong certification program and uh, interop events that let people test that. And then uh, there's gotta be a good way to communicate that fact to the to the customers so they know that this is something that they can do and they, they're encouraged to both buy the, the Internet of Things dashboard from the cable company and also um, know which devices they should look for when they're purchasing things. Um, we also need good development support, a uh, really simple development process so uh, manufacturers can easily add support for um, this sort of interoperability and security into their systems. And it's got to work on multiple operating systems, different microcontrollers, uh, and different programming languages, and it's got to support this common IoT platform. I also think you need a common backend system so your own customer service people can support the product so you have a common view of, of the uh, Internet of Things across your different business units. So whether it's consumers or businesses or industry or smart cities, you've gotta be able to have that same control and make it manageable. That's also, I think, how you make the Internet of Things profitable um, because the business cases are marginal uh, if you look at them individually, but if you build a common infrastructure, you can leverage that investment across all the different uh, Internet of Things products you want to offer. So uh, besides representing Shaw, um, I also work on the uh, OCF standards committees. And uh, it's a standards body that, that is meant to solve these problems that I brought up in the beginning here. So it has strong security built in from the start. That was designed in. And that uh, really is what uh, justified the cable industry's um, involvement. So besides Shaw, there are several other cable companies who are members, and uh, Cable Labs is on the board of directors. And uh, 
So we really wanted to make sure the cable requirements got into an open standard that lots of different companies support. So there's about 450 companies in OCF and several of the major manufacturers that you might want to work with, like uh, Samsung and LG and uh, Honeywell, uh, several like that. So uh, it meets those requirements. We also want this three pillar alignment of different uh, pieces of the puzzle. So first of all, you've got to have a written down standard that everybody knows they can build to. And if they build to that standard, it will work. The second thing is you've got to have a way to check that. So um, a test tool that will be able to verify that you're meeting that standard. And the third thing I think is really one of the most important things, but is often overlooked. Uh, you've got to have an officially supported open source implementation that meets those standards. And what OCF does is every six months, it aligns those things. So it makes sure it has a test tool that implements all the latest tests of the standards. It's got to have a standard that's publicly available to anybody for free. And it's got uh, an open source implementation that actually passes this test tool and meets the standard. So the other things that uh, kind of make up OCF and make it uh, a, a nice platform to work with, it, it's, as I mentioned, it's a common platform. It works on several different operating systems. Um, it's a RESTful architecture, so it's very easy to work with. You send commands just like the internet. It executes the commands and sends you the status back. The certification program I already mentioned you got to have best in class security with PKI infrastructure, and it's got to be lightweight enough that it can run on these minimal platforms that people want to use in their IoT products. So um, that's there. And uh, this gives you an uh, idea of sort of the, the um, way it's architected. There is a local network uh, just your local network in your home or your business, and it will work directly across that. So if you perhaps lose connectivity with the, the internet, you don't lose control of your door locks or your alarm systems, things like that. But it's also got to have that cloud piece in there for two reasons. One is so you can reach it from your smartphone, for example, when you're out of the home, but also uh, so you can interop with other operators. So a lot of vendors have a cloud-based service. You've got to be able to communicate with that cloud. And for interoperability, those different manufacturers may want to make sure they interop properly with each other as well. And uh, so the service provider is, is a, an organization that can sit kind of in between those places and provide the different pieces that the manufacturers need and the customers need to bring this all together. Um, the, the cable industry has changed uh, an awful lot since I started a long time ago. And uh, it, uh, one of the main changes is that it's moved a lot closer to the internet, a lot further away from linear video and dedicated uh, uh, service like that to a more flexible service. Um, but in that uh, transition, I think there's one core competency that we've maintained, and that is aggregation. So in the video business, we would bring together different channels, uh, provide a set-top box, and make it so it's easy for the customer to get the content they want when they want it. And I think we still have that core competency when it comes to the internet, especially the internet of things, which I view as uh, sort of the platform that we're evolving to as, as we lose maybe linear video subscribers, we're gaining these uh, subscribers to our data service. And I think ultimately to the ultimate platform, which is the internet of things. And we can use the uh, internet of things to build virtually any service that the customer wants. So I, I see that more as an opportunity than the threat of, of losing linear subscribers. 
Um, so I've talked about this a little bit already, um, but this diagrams a little bit of how that security works. So um, I'll let you review this later on your own if you'd like, but um, the security uh, checks with the cloud, checks with the PKI chain to the root of trust, uh, uses the same uh, type of architecture that you're uh, familiar with in, in other very secure platforms. And so we do all that, and this uh, gives you some of the details around that. Um, one of the pieces that's critical in the interoperability is how do you get to these other ecosystems? Should you uh, go to Zigbee and ask them all to, to abandon what they've built and, and uh, move to your system? Well, that's not going to work. So what you've got to have is bridging and something that OCF calls derived models. Those derived models just map uh, a simple data description of the device to the data description of the device that exists in the other ecosystem. So um, those are uh, written in a simple JSON schema, kind of a programming language, that allows you to describe how you do that mapping between the two. And that makes it really simple for uh, an op or a manufacturer that has built to another ecosystem to add OCF to their ecosystem. And the simplicity in development, I'll show you that in more detail in a moment here. Uh, you ought to be able to quickly develop products. You need to have the tools to build, to test, and to prototype things quickly. And uh, we'll show you exactly how that works and the tools that are available. So let's build a device. This is the hardware I'm going to use. It's a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's connected to Wi-Fi in this room. It's got a little daughter board on top of it that has some lights and some switches, so I'm going to show that to you. Um, and then I've got uh, just an Android uh, device here that we're going to use to control it. So these things are only connected by Wi-Fi in the room. And I'm going to show you how that works. <coughs> so these are the kind of the commands I'm going to execute and show you exactly how that uh, works. But I'll explain it a little bit. Um, uh, the device here is going to run code constantly that allows you to um, turn on some lights and, and monitor some switches. So it's just representative of any device you can, you can build. Um, it'll also run on little things like this, which is more likely to be what you might put in your IoT device. This is a microcontroller that has Wi-Fi built in, and uh, in quantities of one costs about $10. So it's, it's something that's feasible for um, an Internet of Things system. And here's how we're going to do this. So there's a way to simply describe an IoT device in OCF and use this JSON schema to define the different resources that are in there. So if you think of a thermostat, a resource might be the temperature, the ambient temperature, the set temperature you want to use, and a switch to turn on the heater or the air conditioner when a threshold is met. So those resources are individually controllable. And when you describe a device, you just write something like this to, to describe the different resources that are on that. On this, um, I've got several resources. I've got four lights. I've got several eight switches and some analog inputs and outputs and digital inputs and outputs. So it's got about 16, uh, 17, something like that resources on it. And it's, uh, if you have a, something like a refrigerator, then you may have hundreds of resources. But still, it's just a simple uh, file like this that describes exactly what that does and gives you all the details. And so there's a few tools here. Gen.sh is actually going to take that input file and is going to create C source code from it. It does that uh, for this device in about a minute. Um, Build.sh actually compiles the code and links it so it can run on the device. Reset resets the security so that you can own the device. So you'll see the security demonstration and then run just runs the device and, and everything works from that point. So, and the other piece is on uh, the Android device, 
we've got um, a sort of generic client and onboarding tool. So what it does is it meets all the security requirements, allows you to securely onboard that device into a secure network which sits on top of your IP network at home. So it will, it will do that part, successfully give you ownership of the device, and after that, it'll read that same input file and will generate a generic user interface on its own so you don't have to build it. So all these things are tools that are available from OCF and, and uh, you can get them for free right now. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is gen.sh. So what it's doing right now is it's reading that input file and, <clears throat> and generating C code. So um, it'll take about a, a minute to do this. Um, while it's doing that, I'll explain what's happening over here. So this device um, is uh, the, the controller. So um, once this gets up and running, which we'll, we'll do after we compile the code, it will, um, it will have a device there that's discoverable by the controller. So the first thing we're gonna do on the controller is uh, discover devices that are available unless any of you have an OCF device running on your phones or something, it, it'll just find one. And, uh, and then um, once we find that, we'll be able to onboard it. And onboarding it is what takes it from just a general uh, Wi-Fi connection to a secure domain within your um, Wi-Fi network. And uh, at that point, We'll, it will change a little bit more and we'll um, hit the button to execute the user interface and then we'll be able to uh, turn the light on on the device. So that's what is hopefully going to happen here. Uh, we just need to wait for this to uh, finish um, generating the code. Um, yeah, so what it does, it generates code stubs. So just running this tool will generate running code that will run every resource that, that uh, is defined in that input file, but it won't connect it to your hardware. So what I've done is I've gone in, and this is also what I've done in advance, I've gone in and added like two or three lines to each of those code stubs that connect it to essentially the pins on the board. So that's, that's what's going on there. <laughs> All right, um, I'll tell you what, let me let, uh, let Chuck go, and I'll see if I can get this running in its final form um, at the end, so. So guys, uh, good morning to everyone. I'm Chuck Chapman. Um, I uh, work for Alpha, who's now an Enersys company, and um, actually worked in cable for about the last 31 years. The way I look at it is that cable's actually taking care of myself and my family for a long time. So those wires outside your house, they're important. And to keep those wires relevant is also important. So this is what I'm actually hoping we're gonna be able to do is to uh, keep those wires running. Can anybody tell me what this is? I know it's kind of hard to see for some people. Maybe this will give you a better idea. That's a mousetrap. So what's the old adage, right? If you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Welcome to a better mousetrap. This is a LoRaWAN connected mousetrap. It actually can tell you that first of all, it's armed, as they say, or it's been triggered and it's caught something or it's triggered and it missed. Why is that important? Um, I don't know if you guys have ever had a mouse that died in your house that's been in there for a couple of days, it's just not pleasant. <laughs> for those of you that don't like the visual, this is another industrial mousetrap. It's actually made by Victor. Um, and this one hides the evidence so you can dispose of it. Um, the interesting part too is that when you look at the, uh, at the IoT feedback you get from this, it sounds more like you've uh, got a, uh, a seal working for you because it says successful kill. <laughs> So what do these communicate over? These communicate over a protocol called LoRaWAN or LoRaWAN, depending on what part of the world you live in. So what LoRaWAN is, is an LPWAN standard, low power wide area network. It uses a function called chirp spread spectrum. Um, this form of modulation is actually extremely efficient. 
uh, can broadcast these devices actually in a, in a rural environment can transmit up to 25 kilometers or about 16 miles. Sorry about moving back and forth on the microphone here. Um, in an urban environment, you're probably looking at more like a five mile range. The thing is that's five miles as long as you have a fairly good connection. So putting things like steel or concrete or something like that between this device and the gateway that it's talking to can be a problem. I have a fully functional LoRaWAN system running here on the floor. What's interesting though, even though my gateway is down in my, uh, in my exhibition area, this device is being seen, but I have other devices here that can't be seen. Um, okay. Don't mind me. Oh, okay, gotcha. So the, uh, <laughs> the best made plans of mice and men, right? <laughs> Back to the mice again. Um, so it actually can't reach it. Some sensors can. This is the reason that industrial IoT should actually most likely be deployed with the gateways outside, because you actually have less physical things between the gateway and the device. Um, industrial IoT are those things that are outside of what you would consider normal IoT. They're not a smart watch connected to your phone. Um, they're um, things like water meters. Um, electric meters, parking sensors, garbage fill sensors. Each one of these has a good vertical. They all have uh, a successful payoff in a smart city. The HFC environment is a great deployment architecture for smart city. You guys have the four things that are necessary to deploy a smart city. You have power, you have backhaul, you have real estate, and you have ownership. Those things go together to actually produce an environment that you can do a long-term successful deployment of IoT. Hey, there we go. <clears throat> okay. Let me just go back one, see where I'm at. So let me just go through a couple of acronyms real fast, just so you know. I'm gonna be talking about industrial IoT. This is a, and this is a subsection of IoT. Um, I'll be discussing communication over LoRaWAN. Um, which is using the LoRa standard. LoRa standard uses chirp thread spectrum. LoRaWAN defines the protocol behind those communications and how they're secured and how the data is transmitted back and forth. These devices that I have here, uh, everything from this element that's pretty much just a basic anything you want it to be to this parking sensor are called a moat. They communicate over RF, which we all know they use a technology called frequency hopping spread spectrum using a chirp spread spectrum modulation. There is a term in this, um, you guys all work in QAM and different things like that, you know the different modulation schemes, QAM 16, QAM 64, QAM 1024. In chirp spread spectrum, it's actually something called spreading factor. So spreading factor is how the modulation is done. We'll talk about that, I'll show you how that works. Uh, there's bandwidth, there's actually two bandwidths that are commonly used. Uh, the data rate is the amount of data that we can send over it. But when you talk about data rate and modulation, it's actually the spreading factor and the, and the uh, bandwidth that's being used. These use the ISM band, uh, industrial, scientific, and medical, which is also used by Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi uses the 2.4 and 5 gig. This uses a frequency from 902 to 928, the 900 megahertz band. In Europe, it's different. It's 868. In other parts of the world, it's 423. But we're gonna be talking about the, the Americas here when we're talking about this. Just like what you do in cable, there's an upstream and downstream. Uh, primarily what I'm considering or what I'm working with is the upstream communication. There is downstream considerations as well. Upstream will use the transmitter in this device. The downstream will use the, uh, will use the receiver. Uh, Federal Communication Commission was very uh, key in getting this done. And then there is two forms of activation. There's over-the-air activation and then activation by personalization. Again, the moats, there's many, many moats, um, and each one is designed to hit a specific target. In smart parking, there's several ways of doing smart parking in a smart city. There's video, as well as this puck sensor. This sensor would go into each parking space and using the geomagnetic influence of the car on the Earth's magnetic field, it'll actually pick up and tell you when a car is there. Um, this is a garbage sensor, okay? What is a garbage sensor? It's for optimized waste collection. 
So with this, a, a waste collection company can actually optimize their travel and make sure that they're doing the most optimized travel for both utilization of personnel, efficiencies, and reduction of their carbon footprint and traffic. Um, you saw my uh, pest control things that we have down here. There's all sorts of different things. Pretty much industrial are things that utilities would use, cities would use um, to monitor their systems. The system I'm gonna be talking about again is LoRaWAN. Now LoRaWAN has a regional definition. Because they're not using the Wi-Fi spectrum, this other ISM band uh, tends to vary from country to country. Each different country having different elements of this band. And we're gonna talk about the US 915. That is the name that the LoRaWAN Alliance gave to it. It's actually not just the US, it actually has Argentina, Canada, Jamaica, Mexico, Nicaragua. So there's a lot of countries in the Americas that use this similar um, modulation frequency range. So again, <clears throat> LoRa is the physical layer. LoRaWAN is the international communication standard on the phi layer. Uh, the two together in, create an environment that actually uh, creates a low power, low data rate. The thing about any of these in a smart city application, they have to meet certain criteria. The first criteria is they have to be cheap, right? Everything in the world has to be cheap. Um, they're not there yet. I'll just be honest with you for what I've had to pay for moats, these are not cheap yet. They're going to get cheaper. Um, they have to support a long range. You cannot afford to put in a gateway for every one of these devices. So they have to be able to communicate over a very long range. The last thing is that communication has to be available for a very long time. So depending on what the unit uses, whether it's using an energy harvesting technology like this, I don't know if you can see it, but the little blue light's turning on, this is based on solar, or if it's using something like this, that's an energy harvester that uh, uses thermal energy and actually will light this LED off of the temperature of my hand. These are energy harvesters. The problem with both of these is that they have specific requirements. And to be honest, they're expensive in comparison to a battery. So 95% plus of the moats you'll get will be battery operated. This device is designed to be embedded in the pavement and it's supposed to have a 10 year battery life. If everything is great in the world, this will sustain a 10 year battery life, but there are conditions that it can quickly deplete the batteries. The reason that I actually went into this is that I have several moats. You can see them in this little sensor array I have down here. I had one moat that had a six month battery life, but because I wasn't connected to a gateway, I used up the battery in seven days, which, okay, it's a pain. I have to go to Walmart or whatever, buy a you know, 2045 battery, throw it in there. But from the uh, aspect of having to dig it out of the pavement, try to dig the pavement out to undo the screws, Huge difference. Battery replacement is gonna be a huge consideration. There's a lot of other standards that are out there for IoT. There's LTEM, narrowband IoT, which is gonna be produced by a lot of the cellular companies. There's Sigfox, it's a proprietary end-to-end -end system. These are all valid deployments. The thing is, is what you're gonna to have to go in is with an extra arrow in your quiver to say, yes, they work, that's fine but we can deploy this in such a way that I can guarantee that you have longer battery life than you will with those other solutions. Because HFC gives you the availability to put these in many different areas. If you have a coverage issue, you can quickly put in another gateway to discover that particular area. This is the LoRa modulation. This is chirp spread spectrum. Um, actually, it's fairly difficult to get a picture like this. You either have to have a super high speed analyzer or do what I did, which is effectively just gather the data and then using some software actually expand it. What you'll see, uh, you'll see these are a section of up chirps and down chirps. Uh, what you're looking at in this particular uh, graph is you have time going from, going from left to right. You have frequency actually going from bottom to top. It's kind of, it's kind of backwards. So we can imagine it's a, it's a chart that I turn sideways. So on, on this, what you'll see is the first eight or, eight or so bits are going in one direction. Uh, this is a, a, there's a down chirp and an up chirp. And then after that, you'll see two other chirps. It's actually two and a quarter. That's the synchronization byte. So you have the preamble, the synchronization, and then the modulation is after this. 
Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, this one is about 400 milliseconds long. This is actually a very low speed connection. During this transmission, the transmitter was on doing its thing. And by the way, if you look at these chirps, this transmitter was on during the entire time. It does not turn off. It sweeps up through the signals, then goes back and sweeps up again, sweeps up again. Um, so the transmitter is on. The other thing that's on is the CPU in the unit, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but CPUs do have um, a lot of clock cycles. They will eat up a lot of bandwidth. This is 125 kilohertz. This is a spreading factor of, uh, I believe, 10 in the 125 kilohertz. This is a look at another modulation. So this is a spreading factor of eight in a 500 kilohertz. This is actually very fast. So if I put it in comparison and overlay it on the other, even though it's a much wider bandwidth, the time the transmitter on is extremely small. Now, even though it's sweeping again over a very wide bram width, the transmitter is only on for that period of time. This greatly reduces the amount of energy needed. If you look at the long, long one that took a lot of time, that actually, uh, that actually depletes the battery much faster. And I've, I've got a uh, capture here to show you that. So in order to capture this, what I did is I took a, um, I took a scope, I put it on the unit, and what you're seeing here is the current draw over time. And I kind of highlighted here, you'll see the effectively where the unit turns itself on. It went from the deep sleep mode back into the operational mode, turned on its transmitter. The first one, uh, I'll show you a little later, I actually put the span on it, but that's when the transmitter's on. And this is running what they call A mode. So it turns on the transmitter and then it waits one second and it turns on its receiver for a second. This is so that you can have two-way communication without actually using up your battery. If I left the receiver on all the time, the battery would deplete very quickly. So by turning it on this way, I actually just turn on the receiver when I have to. I turn it on at the one second mark, listen for a little bit. If I don't hear anything, I'll turn it on a second time, listen again. If I don't hear anything, I'll go off. This first, uh, the second one showing the 66, um, let's see if I can, there we go. Okay, I'll put it over on that one. This is showing you that this is the 400 milliseconds. So this is actually that long, thin one that I showed you. This next one is showing you the short time that it's actually on. Right here, sorry. This is the 25 milliseconds. Now I had to change my scope settings here because before it was so small you couldn't even scale it. Also down here, you'll notice that there's some additional beeps. This is because at this point I had to put on a uh, I had to put on a, a logger so that I'd know that it actually changed to the other frequency. This, this down here is not normally there. Semtech is actually the company that came up with the, the, LoRa, the LoRa protocol, and they have a really cool calculator tool. And this calculator tool allows you to put in a scenario. So in a scenario here, I can put down my spreading factor is 10, my bandwidth is 125 kilohertz, my coding rates, all this different thing and it will tell you effectively how long the transmitter will be on in the estimated power demand. There's a second page that you go to and it tells you down here, which is really important, how long the battery life will be. So you can see in this, in this consideration, again, with the very slow modulation, very long distance to a gateway, that I'm actually gonna run about two years on a battery. If I progress to the next slide, You'll see here that I changed it. I went again to a spreading factor of eight, bandwidth of 500, and I now have an estimated battery lifetime in excess, uh, let's see, it's 4,000, so in excess of 10 years. Just by effectively, from a scenario aspect, moving this moat so that it's closer to a gateway. And again, in an HFC environment, it's very easy to deploy gateways in this particular function. Um, there is, um, an interesting thing in the FCC, so Semtech actually designed this more for Europe initially. Europe only has like 10 channels, very easy to do. The US has 72 channels, so it's a little bit, uh, little bit more difficult. There's full spectrum versus H, uh, what we call hybrid mode, FCC hybrid mode. Uh, there's some other considerations too. Timing over the air activation is different than a normal message timing. The LoRaWAN confirmation messages are available. They're very useful, but if they don't get confirmed, they actually can be a problem. Uh, in addition to this, there's also an automatic data rate, ADR, 
which will allow the gateway and the moat to discuss uh, things back and forth. And actually, the gateway can tell the moat to change its modulation profile. So again, there's 72 channels in this US 902 to 928. It's a um, mixture of 64 125 kilohertz channels that are interleaved with 1.6 megahertz um, spacing on 500 kilohertz channels. So effectively, there's groups that you can put together. If you can imagine there's eight 64K or 64, I'm sorry, there's eight 125 kilohertz channels with one 500 kilohertz channel. And then there's eight groups of these. Um, if you can use the entire bandwidth, you can transmit at plus 30 dBm. Um, in the, the data transmission mode, it's actually around plus 26 for the 500 kilohertz channels. In hybrid mode, it's plus 21. What's hybrid mode? So what the FCC decided is that, you know what? It's going to be really expensive to build gateways that cover the entire band. So what we can do is we're going to take a section of that band and we're going to say, we're going to divide it up into eight sections. And if you can build a gateway that'll handle these eight sections, as long as you do these modifications, you can work. So you turn down your transmitter and you always make sure under any circumstance that you don't transmit for longer than 400 milliseconds. This is actually one of the reasons that US 915 is actually a little bit less capable than the Europe 915 because they don't have this requirement. They can transmit for longer than a half a second. Um, also with directional gain on your antennas, I have a lot of antennas up here. Um, you just have to make sure that your gain is no, no more than plus 60 BI. And if it's more than 60 BI, go ahead and make sure you turn down the channel. This is the, uh, a lineup, actually, a representation of the way you break out US hybrid mode. Um, by the LoRa Alliance, the second group, uh, which is uh, normally referred to as group two, is the default. This can be a problem, actually, I just found out in moats, because some moats, the code actually, even though you tell it to go to a different one, it will still go back and talk on the other one once in a while. So it, that can be a little bit of a uh, nuance. So you might want to set up your system if you're going to use hybrid mode on channel on band two. This is a visualization. This is actually out of one of my gateways showing how you can select these channels. You select your center frequency, and they will receive all of these channels at the same time. The cool part about chirps red spectrum is that it's octagonal in the way that it does its, uh, its spreading factors. So you actually can have a communication on the same channel at the same time and decode them simultaneously. That's some of the interesting parts of this chirp spread spectrum. Um, and you'll see here, you'll see my green channels. These are my 125 kilohertz. My blue channel is my uh, 1.6 megahertz. To kind of go over this, I talked about over-the-air activation. That's one of the things. So when I get a moat, I program it into my system. I hit the button on my moat, it goes into an over-the-air activation, which means it talks to the gateway. It knows its device ID called the UID. It'll pull that out. Um, it will then communicate back and forth and actually provision itself in the system. The timing on this, in most communications, you have your main communication and then one second and two seconds after the receivers are turned on. In, in over-the-air activation, because it takes extra processing time, they actually set that at five seconds and six seconds. Okay, got it. Um, you go through, and um, this is another example. This is uh, confirmation messages. So you can have the gateway confirm that it received the message, kind of like TCP. Or you can use UDP if you would like, I'm just making analogies here, where it actually doesn't confirm it. Um, secondarily to that, if you do have confirmation turned on and it does not actually get confirmed, the transmitter will do retries, which eats up your batteries. Uh, there is an automatic data rate. This is uh, one of the data rate calculators that you can get. Uh, it's online on the things network, and it just shows you the timing of each different, uh, each different modulation. On antenna gain, like I said, they range anywhere from this side to this size. The one thing to remember on antenna gain is something called the uh, National Electric Safety Code. This won't work in a uh, HFC environment. It's too long. When you start talking about uh, getting the system to, uh, to work over distance, there is things called path loss. So you have your transmitter, your cable loss, then you have antenna gain, and then you have your RF path loss. Now RF path loss in free air is very, you know, it's logarithmic, it's very well defined. 
At the other end, then you have antenna gain, loss, and then the receiver sensitivity. If you have something though in the middle, it will actually cause some huge issues. This is a modeling software uh, that I put together. It's actually showing you this would be a deployment of LoRaWAN if there was not an urban environment, if this was done in like a, uh, in a rural environment. And you'll see what I did was highlight the data rates based on the RSSI. If I add in the buildings, the buildings actually impact it and you end up with a huge amount of shadowing. So the batteries over here are gonna run for 10 years. The batteries back here are only gonna run for three or four, sorry. Should do it here. Batteries here, 10 years, battery over here, a lot less. But if you add a second gateway, super easy to do. I actually take care of that. Now I can guarantee the customer a 10 year battery life anywhere he puts them. So the HFC strand, again, it's proven communications. It's got reliable power. It's aerial in nature for a lot of things and it provides ownership and control. This is a HFC deployed LoRa, LoRa receiver, LoRa gateway. Uh, it backhauls a Redoxus. And then it has the two antennas. If you notice, they actually fit within the NESC uh, requirements. This is physically what one looks like when it's on the strand. Pretty easy to put up. Actually, MachineQ deployed a lot of this sort of uh, solution. Again, one thing to remember, minimum clearances, make sure that you uh, do not violate. Don't go above the strand very much with the antennas and you can't violate more than 12 inches below. The one thing too to remember, even though your modeling software may tell you to put things in certain places, as is shown here in these highlighted, modded, highlighted reels from a deployment, um, make sure that you don't have physical, physical issues. Like here, the terrain went up and here we had a metal building this unit had to be moved because it was completely ineffective. So in summary, moats are disparately deployed. Uh, they can be difficult to access. The battery life is, is critical because battery replacement is extremely expensive. Um, moats use uh, more power when they're in a low, a low signal uh, environment where they have to actually transmit over long dis longer distances. And uh, HFC gateways are a great way to improve battery life. I do okay? So we have a couple of minutes. I know Clark's demo is actually working now, so um, because we have a small group, maybe you can come up and have a look at it running on his laptop if uh, anybody wants to. Any questions for both Clark and Chuck then from the audience? Joe. Yeah, I'm assuming you mentioned about the um, power uses for devices that are far near the gate on the floor. Yes. I'm assuming you're doing like a dynamic power adjustment. Right? Yes, well. automatic power, uh, uh, APR. Okay. Uh, or ADR, automatic data rate, which is effectively doing the power. It adjusts the power of the transmitter and it adjusts the spreading factor. Right. So, so the, the battery was 2450? Uh, in this particular mode that I ran into a problem, yes, it was a 2450. Uh, most of these, you know, the, the true industrial ones, this has a pack of like five, you know, almost uh, C size. That I don't even know how they get them in here. Okay. But uh, lithium ion. Any chance to solar power any of this stuff? Absolutely. That's what this is. So, and there's, a, there's actually another IoT called Power of the IoT, and they are showing how to use energy harvesting, solar, and, uh, and other things for that. Is it yours? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed it. No, that's fine. No, very good. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Any other questions? Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, we really appreciate your time. Any questions you guys have, you know, we're available. I mean, I'll be in the alpha booth. So just shoot by. We actually have all this stuff running. So if you want to get a look at it and actually see the solutions. And I, I promise I won't arm the mousetraps and your fingers will be safe. <laughs> Just a, a quick one for Clark then. From a Shaw perspective, Clark, where do you, where do you see the, the IoT? You, you mentioned being able to do a common kind of dashboard for indoor, outdoor, business, residential. Where, where do you see it right. all going? So what I'd really like to see is uh, being able to build a common infrastructure that can work across um, all these different uh, markets and uh, still be scalable to the different use cases we want to support. Anybody wants to check out the OCF Foundation and join, as Clark said, it's, a, it's an open source standard. It certainly serves as a really good um, 
server for all these different protocols and that dashboard that Clark mentioned. So check it out and see if your company can join it because I think we can we can move that standard in the direction the cable industry wants to go. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank the, thank the panelists. I would like to all also thank you for coming along to how never do live demos and change <laughs> HDMI ports. The two guys did a great job. They deserve the respect of doing all this kind of stuff real time. So thank you very much. Thank you.